Hello everyone, thank you for joining. I'm just going to wait a moment or two while some other people sign on. Thank you. Hello everyone, and welcome to this Content Marketing Masterclass webinar produced in partnership with Constant Content. By means of introduction, I'm Andrew Warren Payne, Senior Consultant for Clixi Intelligence. After a few housekeeping notes and a quick poll, I'll be handing over to our experts today. Joining us first is Chris Reed, Business Development Manager at Constant Content. We'll be kicking things off discussing how you can get your content marketing to add value and convert. Following this, we have Matt Owen, Global Social Media Manager at Shell, to discuss content marketing strategy. Then we'll hear from Mark Anderson, who leads SEO and content at multi channel footwear retailer Shu, telling us about his approach to content that converts. And then after that, we'll be taking your questions and giving you actionable advice to put into place right away. Now, while I briefly go through some housekeeping notes, uh, on your screen you should see a poll asking you what your organization's greatest marketing challenge is. We'll be using your answers to kick off the discussion later in this webinar, so please make your response known by clicking on one of the options and pressing submit. If you have any other questions during the session today, you can leave these in the Q&A function and we'll be answering them at the end. We'll also be recording this webinar and we'll send you a link to the video so you can review it at your leisure. And finally, do tweet your reactions and thoughts to at ClickZ and at Constant Content so we can feature some of the best in the Roundup blog post to follow. So, I'm almost uh, ready to hand over to Chris, so get your answers in before and press submit quickly. Right, so to begin the presentation today, and without further uh, ado, uh, over to Chris, who's going to do ask, is your content converting? Chris? Hey, thanks, Andrew. I appreciate that. Uh, first off, just wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. I know you all have really busy schedules, uh, so we're going to make sure that you walk away with some value today in the uh, presentation that we're doing. So to kick it off here, uh, the Content Marketing Masterclass. Is your content converting? So, quick overview of who we are if you aren't familiar with Constant Content. Uh, Constant Content, you know, we've been live for 10 years now. We're one of the pioneers in the content space online. So, we started off as a small site years ago where we sold pre written, unique articles. Uh, as the industries evolved, our platform now uh, supports many big brands and agencies to utilize our network of freelance writers to supplement their internal team to create custom tailored content. So I am Chris Reed. I'm the business development manager here at Constant Content. Uh, during my time here at Constant Content, I've had the pleasure to onboard and continue to work with companies to take their content efforts and help them understand the benefits of quality and valuable content. But enough about me. Why are we here today? We're here to talk content. So why should we care about content? Well, the content marketing field is getting more and more crowded, so the importance of knowing your audience and adding value is increasing. There's a quote here from the 60 Second Marketer that really drives this message home, and that's the only way to win at content marketing is for the reader to say, that this was written especially for me. Meaning, we are in a world where we're continuously getting hit in every direction with advertisements and messaging. So where we used to see our traditional methods of marketing performing are now losing some strength. Content marketing is a great way to connect with your people and reach them on a more personal level. Content marketing gives us the ability to connect and bring more significant value by conveying your brand's personality. Now, I quickly want to look at the content marketing definition here. 
There's a couple key takeaways that I want you to remember. So content marketing is the marketing and business process for creating and distributing relevant and valuable content to attract, acquire, and engage a clearly defined and understood target audience with the objective of driving profitable and customer action. So key points here I want you to remember is that it's relevant and valuable content. So how do we add value? Well, I want to look at the version that we've created here that was from the Content Marketing Institute. There are five points you should be checking off with the content that you are creating and developing. The first one here, is it findable? So can the user find the content? So in the world of SEO, search engines love valuable content. I think we've kind of come to that conclusion. So they want to see that all your content is unique and that it brings value to your reader. Your on-page content and your metadata needs to be original and needs to resonate with your audience. Which takes us to our next point, readable. Can their user read the content? People these days, they have very short attention span. So when they're going through, they only read about 28% of the words on a page. So best practices that you can take here is to keep them engaged would be through areas of having strong headlines, lists, bullets, subheads, and shorter paragraphs. Now, is the content that you're creating, it is it understandable? So for an example, you and your team, you could have just created some content and to you guys, it looks great. But this content needs to make sense to your audience at the right stage of the purchase funnel. So think, is this too technical for the awareness stage? Is it too fluffy or non-descriptive for the decision stage? Is it clear and contextual? Or is it too full of jargon or is it too bland? If your content is not resonating with your target audience, then you're going to miss the mark. So taking the time to understand who your customers are is going to help you. To our next point here is actionable. So we want the user to take action when we, within the content. So think to yourself, does your content drive your readers to make a purchase? Is there a clear and logical call to action within the content? If there isn't, your goals are not going to be achievable. And then the last point here about adding value, so shareable. Will the user want to share this content that you've created? This is a really important factor. So word of mouth is an amazing thing. So Intuit CEO Brad Smith says that 81% of sales are directly attributable to word of mouth. If you are providing a content stream that is bringing value to your customers, your customers will do some of the work by sharing it with others because people are more likely to share and spread great content if they find that content has brought them value. Seeing what works in terms of engagement and sharing is also a great way to figure out what resonates with your audience and what doesn't. So what do successful brands do? So I'm going to go off what I've done here at Constant Content. I've worked with a lot of companies and I've seen a lot of companies fail and a lot of companies succeed with their content. So what do the successful companies do differently? Well, I'll tell you what they do. They start by understanding who their customers are. When they know who their customers are and what they want, they're able to follow them through their buying journey, and then they can provide them the valuable content, sorry, content to answer their need. These brands effectively provide a relevant stream of constant content for their customers. So we're going to go through the content by stage here. So, Great content, when well-written and optimized, can impact every stage of the consumer's decision-making journey and push people down the funnel faster. So remember, 76% of buyers want different content at each stage of their research or purchase journey. Stage-based marketing is growing more and more important as buyer preferences change, meaning that marketers need to start creating content for each stage of their sales funnel, and that 80% of decision makers 
prefer to get information in a series of digestible chunks. So, targeting your content, formats, and focusing on buyer's journey stage is very vital. So I know a lot of you love stats, so let's take a look at some stats here. 89% of customers begin their buying process with a search engine. Google, Bing. Companies that have a blog have 434% more search engine penetration than those that don't. And companies that have a blog have 97% more inbound links than companies that do not. So in the end, it's all about what? Creating engaging, compelling, search engine optimized content. So I want to go back to the content stage and the purchase funnel. Let's take a hard look at optimized content, SEO, and what successful brands do. Great SEO can get generic product searches to show for awareness. It will result in brand searches during the consideration stage, and your original optimized content on deeper product pages will rank higher in the results than those with standard vendor copy. And your unique, original, relevant content will also help drive more conversions. So 2017, I'm talking about really nailing down your product pages with well-written product descriptions. And I'm going to walk you through why this is so critical, because this is the bread and butter for all e-commerce companies. So product descriptions. If there is a major takeaway from this webinar today, it is around creating great content with your product and category pages. So many businesses lack, are lacking in this area right now, and we're going to find out how you can make a difference with 2017 and moving forward. Now, what I'm sharing with you today, this is what's worked for some of our smaller e-commerce sites we work with up towards our Fortune 500 clients, and how those Fortune 500 clients are holding market share and continuing to have revenue in the billions. So for, for those that are listening right now who are on, on the line, many of you, you may sell products online and you're reselling your vendor's products, or in some cases you may have your own proprietary products. But the case of having great content for all your product descriptions is no less important for either type of business. So product descriptions. This is how I look at product descriptions, and it may be a way for you to look at it now too. So if your site, if you guys have a brick and mortar location, I'm going to assume that you guys have in-store sales associates. So why do you have in-store sales associates? Well, because your sales associates are there to help share the benefits of the products you sell, to give a background of why the product can bring them value, or how it solves the pain point, or just to even explain how cool that product is and why they need to have it. So with product descriptions, I want you to think of your product descriptions or your category page content as your online sales associate. If your in-store sales associate were to say the same thing as all the other stores that sell the same product, what is going to make you different and stand out? Your product descriptions are here to tell your story. Why should your clients buy from you and not the store down the road? In a brick and mortar, customers have the ability to pick up your product, they can touch it, they can feel it. This is often a deciding factor when purchasing. So how do you create the same level of engagement online? You need to find a way for your product descriptions to ignite your customer's imagination. I said ignite their imagination. If customers can see a great image of the product and read a compelling description, there's a better chance they're going to convert and buy. But if you go the other route and you want to use the same copy as your manufacturer and vendor sent you, your online sales associate is basically saying the exact same thing as your competitors. We are here to try and build brand loyalty and customer loyalty. So if you are providing the same thing as everyone else, nothing makes you different. And at the end of the day, what's everyone else going to do? They're probably going to go to that big box called Amazon. So let's stand out from them and bring customers to you. 
So like I mentioned before, I've seen a lot of clients that I work with have a lot of success, and the common denominator is that they know their customers, and they are always learning and tailoring their product descriptions, their category pages, and other content streams to keep their customers engaged. And how do they do this? By providing value for their customers online is the very first step. So I'm going to give you an example here. So I'm a, a big gardener, not by choice. You know, I, I basically at my house, I do the jobs that my wife doesn't want to do. So I've learned to love gardening the hard way. Now, when I'm in there, I hate a couple things. I hate getting dirty. I hate being on my knees because they get sore. So here I'm searching for a product that's going to help bring me a solution to my issue. So let's take a look at the impact here of original, unique content within the search engine. So like I mentioned, I'm looking for a kneeling pad for my gardening issue. So I Google hit here, there's two options we're gonna look at here. So we have the first option, hay needle, and we're gonna reference the fifth option, which is Walmart. Hay needle is ranking number one, Walmart's number five. You're gonna see that hay needle has a more optimized meta description. It's clear to me, the searcher, what the product is. Or if you look at Walmart's meta description, it's not nearly as clear and it's not bringing me a whole lot of value. We touched on value. So I'm gonna click through to the hay needle because it's number one and it brought me value within the engine. Now remember, click throughs are great, but what's more important than a click through? It's that C word, it's converting. We're converting the sale. So hay needle has done a really great job here with their product description and we're gonna go over that right now. So I've highlighted it here on the side in the bubble, and we're just gonna to touch on a few key points that I mentioned that I'll be looking for in a product. So the highlighting the key benefits is gonna bring value. So here we are, we have easy on the knees, softness on my knees to cut out the pain. Check, that was a, that was a pain point. I mentioned I don't like getting dirty in the, in the mud when I'm in the garden. It's keeping the mud and dirt off my clothing. It's easy to tote. And then the added value, which I didn't even think about, it makes a seat at a concert for comfort. So they're providing me value before I make that purchase and convert the sale. Now let's turn around and look at Walmart. So we've gone to Walmart here. It's the exact same product. What have they provided? Well, you're gonna see they have the same picture and they have three small points. Point one, it has carry handles. That's good, but doesn't solve the issue that I was thinking. The next option is oval shaped. Well, I'm looking at this and it actually looks like a rectangle to me, but I could be wrong here. So another point, and it's hand woven willow basket. So none of the points that I was looking for are bringing value. So where am I gonna go to make that purchase? I'm gonna go to the site that's brought value and I connected with on that description. So we talked a lot about value. So remember this, if your presence doesn't add value, your absence won't make a difference. If you can't build a relationship with your customers, then how do you expect to keep them as customers? If a customer can rely on you to provide the details they're looking for when making a purchase, you can rely on those customers to continue to come back. And that's what you want. You want to build that brand loyalty. So here's a quote from Bruce Ernst that I think fits really well on this topic. You're going to see on the right-hand side there. Your website isn't the center of the universe. Your Facebook page isn't the center of the universe. Your mobile app isn't the center of the universe. Your customers are the center of the universe. Remember to provide your customers the valuable content they need to keep your business profitable. So a recap of successful brands. So what do successful brands do? They take the time to get to know their customers, to dif differentiate themselves from the pack, to engage their prospects with their, and customers with their unique stories, and to get the pro their, their prospects to take action. They've added value by providing a solution to a pain point or by answering a need. So you may be thinking, what's next? What's next for content marketers here in 2017? Well, there really is no right answer. It's gonna depend on your marketing and business objectives. But I can tell you this, if your goals this year are to drive more qualified traffic and ramp up online conversions, 
then original, compelling, audience-relevant content is critical. So I know there's some data guys out there who love these key points. So I'm going to give you a couple more to remember and take home with you here. So 87% of marketers say that content marketing is a key strategy for 2017. Conversion rates are six times higher for content marketing adopters than non-adopters. Content marketing generates three times as many leads per dollar spent than traditional marketing. And this one's my favorite because I know a lot of you are probably in this same boat and you're working on tight budgets. Guess what? Content marketing is 62% less expensive than traditional marketing. So some of you that are on the call today listening in, you may be coming from a B2C environment or a B2B environment, but guess what? The struggle is real and the struggle is the same for both. Apart from a slight position difference, the top seven issues for both B2B and B2C are exactly the same. Approximately 50% of both B2C and B2B have a strategy issue, so they have a lack of direction and adjusting where needed. 28 to 34% do not have the budget to effectively manage their content efforts. And 30 to 49% for B2C and B2B have challenges creating content. So this could come from either a lack of resources internally or not enough bandwidth to create the amount of content that is needed. And if this is the case, this takes me to my next point, what is the answer? So there's a couple, there's a couple different options here and what we're going to examine is hiring in or working with an outsourced freelancer. So hiring in, what are the benefits and what are the challenges? So the benefits of hiring somebody in-house, you are going to get a new team member. And that new team member could bring you a lot of great experience and bring a lot of innovative ideas to the table. There's a lot of good benefits bringing someone in, but where are the challenges when you bring someone to your team? Well, first off, you have a salary and you have training. Both can get very expensive. That employee is going to take holidays. You can expect that, that, that uh, new team member to be out of the office for probably at least a month out of the year. They may get sick, and they may, at the end of the day, not be a good fit for your team. And at the end of the day, one or two new team members isn't going to give you that scalability if you're looking to increase your content efforts. So where does that take us next? That takes us to that word of freelancers and partnerships. So what are the benefits and what are the pain points to working with freelancers? So the benefits of working with freelancers is that they're going to give you scalability. We just touched on that. Now, I'm kind of going off my experience here. And what the brands I've worked with, where they found some good help with our scalability solutions, is we've been able to supplement their internal teams by giving them bandwidth to take on more strategic projects. So you can give your freelancer team more mundane, high-volume work, which allows your in-house team to work on more structure-driven projects that they need to focus on. It gives you a chance to tap into industry experts. So working with freelancers who know your industry, they know your product, and they know your audience. And at the end of the day, it's going to help you save time, and time equals money. So freelancers work on a pay-as-you-go platform, or pay-as-you-go format, I should say. So when you find that your work is done, your work with that freelancer is finished. So this could be an issue for some, but it's also going to bring a lot of value. Now the challenges here is just finding those freelancers, finding experts, finding English-speaking and writing freelancers, if that's your market, experience in being reliable. And how do you solve this challenge? is working with a partner that you can trust that can bring you the right freelancers to give you that scalability and need. I want to appreciate all listening in. If you have any questions afterwards, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to answer any questions, and we can take it from there. And I'm going to pass it back over to Andrew, and we'll look forward to the Q&A at the end of the webinar here. Perfect.
Thanks very much for that, Chris. That was uh, really insightful. Um, I have one quick question for you before I sort of hand over to Matt. Um, and you mentioned that you've worked with, you know, lots of brands um, over the years, lots of them successful, but some of whom uh, had previously failed. Um, what common mistake uh, do you see all too often and uh, how do you think uh, brands can address this? Yeah, that's a great question, Andrew. And I think where the brands uh, I've seen fail and not succeed like others is they are very one mission focused. And what I mean by that is they're not willing to pivot and just find out what is really resonating with their customers. So when they spend that time to either through A-B testing or different channels to find out what's connecting with them, they find some difficulty. So it really comes down to, like I mentioned earlier in the presentation, of finding out what is hitting home to the customer and creating content that's going to hit them back in that area. Great. Excellent. Well, we've got lots of questions coming in, but I'm going to uh, – thanks very much for your uh, time, Chris. I'm now going to um, hand over to, to Matt, who's going to – uh, discuss uh, content marketing strategy. So uh, Matt's a global social media manager at Shell, and I'm sure he's got uh, lots of interesting things to talk about. So over to you, Matt. Okay, thanks very much, Andrew. And uh, thanks to Chris for that presentation as well. Really interesting stuff. Um, and also, of course, thank you for every to everybody for tuning in today. Um, so yeah, my name's Matt, and I'm in charge of global social media here at Shell. At the moment, I work on products like Helix and Pennzoil and that kind of thing. Um, but my background's actually in sort of technology and uh, marketing intelligence as well, um, including Clixy itself, actually, at some point. So uh, it's nice to be to be back in the saddle. Um, so today, obviously, I want to talk about content marketing strategy. Um, but what I thought was it might be a good idea to sort of strip things back a little bit and define some terms because it often feels to me that there's a certain amount of confusion in the marketing industry when it comes to what makes a content strategy. Um, now, first of all, and most obviously, uh, publishing content doesn't mean you are doing content marketing uh, or that you have a strategy for that matter. Um, because there are thousands of businesses creating content and they're piling it out onto the internet. And some of it is amazing stuff. Some of it's really engaging, really high quality, uh, has measurable value. Um, some of it is, of course, not so amazing. And um, I'm aware that this next slide is not actually content marketing, but it did make me laugh, So, uh, which I actually think has its value in the marketing ecosystem as well. Um, but the downfall of a lot of this content is that it doesn't work in unison. Uh, rather than a concerted effort, content is being created that works as individual pieces, which means it sort of lacks the, the power it needs to drive commercial results. Um, and, you know, if we really want to sort of bring all our guns to bear, then content has to work together, which is where strategy starts to come into the picture. So, you know, it's actually worth noting that, you know, when you add the word strategy to, to just about anything, it uh, instantly changes the way people think about that thing because it sounds impressive and clever and complex and a little bit daunting sometimes, just like our friend Darth here. But it really doesn't need to be. Uh, you know, yes, a large scale, robust strategy will have layers of detail and process and due diligence involved. Um, and, but those are sort of details that you can fill in through your knowledge of your own business. But I think the thought processes behind it, the, the mental model, if you will, should be fairly straightforward. Um, and I'll show you what I mean with uh, a quick example. Uh, so last night I went to Google's Keyword Planner and I put in the phrase, slow cooker, uh, which I chose because I was making beef brisket. And Google gave me a list of search terms, and I ordered them by value, and I popped them into a, into a little list. And then 
I added a couple of positive adjectives to humanize these things a little bit. And this is very basic. It's just an example. Um, but from this, you know, I could start writing headlines for articles about slow cookers. Um, now, you know, I could go away and I could write one a day. And at the end of the month, I'd have 20 or 30 and then 300 odd articles about slow cookers up on my site in a year. And for all intents and purposes, I'd be a content publisher in a niche market. Um, and actually, if I was sort of drop kicking, uh, drop drop kicking, drop shipping <laughs> slow cookers, um, or doing a little bit of affiliate work, that wouldn't wouldn't be a terrible start. Um, but it also wouldn't be content marketing. Uh, incidentally, it's probably worth mentioning. I'm sure we'll talk about it more later, but. Um, this kind of thing also works as the very basic beginnings of SEO um, at a strategic level, and you know I did. I just think obviously it's not to be not to be used. A lot more optimization and research would be required, but it. I think it's a nice illustration of how things like SEO and content and social shouldn't be thought of as separate entities. You know, they really should be functioning as one thing. Uh, but getting back to content for the moment, uh, I thought it would be good to look at how, yeah, how strategy can be applied to, to join things up. Now, one of the big things is that not all your content should be the same. Um, having sort of a variety of formats means you can stretch things further, you can save time, you can repurpose assets, you can appeal to different audiences on different platforms. Uh, but before you do that, you have to start prioritizing things. Now, uh, one of the ways of prioritization I found that I, I quite like is uh, this idea of having hum, sing, and shout content. Uh, I think it's a nice way of contextualizing things which is basically means that your content needs to be tiered. Uh, typically, this is because marketing tends to be campaign-based, which is not really a great way of doing things anymore because customers and us, of course, exist in an always-on world. So we need to be always relevant. Uh, you know, customers don't care if you're if your campaign ended on the 12th, uh, if it's the 14th and they don't see something of interest, they'll probably interact with something from a competitor instead. So, you know, the first part of strategy is prioritization. Which assets go where and when and why? So obviously you can have this sort of base layer of hum content buzzing along. And this could be, this could be articles, but it could be pure social content, for example. You know, it could be tweets and GIFs. Um, and then in the middle, you have this sort of sing, which stands out a little bit more. And this could be more sort of campaign-based, new promotions, that sort of thing. A little bit more focus, possibly a bit more budget. But then finally, you have your, your shout stuff at the top, which is, it comes along rarely, but it influences your marketing for a long time. This is where you, you take your <laughs> slow cooker and you hurl it out of a spaceship. Um, and I say that because you'll all instantly know that I'm referencing the Red Bull Stratos jump. And the fact you do recognize that shows, you know, what a powerful piece of content that was. And it, that's why it keeps popping up in these kind of webinars and presentations, um, because it drove all of Red Bull's other marketing for months afterwards. So that's your kind of shout, uh, shout piece. Um, but so far, I mean, that kind of alignment is within the realm of regular marketing, you know. And the more important piece here, I think, is customer alignment. Um, and as Chris mentioned, earlier, you know, over the past few years, businesses in general have become more customer focused, which is great. Um, I think in, I read some research recently that said that using customer experience to differentiate was sort of seen as the most exciting opportunity by digital marketers. Um, and in order to sort of enhance that customer experience, we have to really 
understand the customer journey and align our content to this. Now, if you really want to succeed in, in any business, um, I think I have always thought that the key is find a problem and solve it and keep solving it. And content should solve every conceivable issue a customer might have when they have it, before they have it, and afterwards so they never experience these problems again. This is the genuinely the core of successful content is being insanely useful, which is easy for me to say, of course, but how does that work? Um, now, hopefully we're all familiar with the typical sales funnel. We create awareness at the top. We probably lose a few customers as we move down into the qualification stage, which for B2B would be sort of where probably marketing qualified leads might sit. And then in B2C, a little more nebulous, but certainly, you know, where customers become more interested in particular products. And then finally, we have a decision stage where hopefully you manage to sell something. Uh, and your content needs to fit that journey as well. You know, there are lots of competing figures about how far along in the journey customers are before they make contact with a vendor. Um, but I think consensus is it's probably around 65, 70%. So content needs to reach customers throughout that journey. So, you know, in the awareness stage, you're looking to attract users who may or may not have heard of your brand. So this is quite broad match stuff, which aligns your brand to an audience. Uh, in this case, Look at uh, people who might be interested in the type of food you can make in a slow cooker. They're not looking for a slow cooker. They're just saying, oh, will it be of any use to me in particular? Um, this is quite a nice example of that kind of content. This is from uh, Wegmans, the supermarket in the US. Um, fairly simple vi videos uh, series about sort of cooking and serving turkey, which was quite useful at Thanksgiving. Um, I actually made a brined turkey and... It was very good. Um, and it's branded, but that's not really intrusive. Um, it's very useful. You know, it makes sure you haven't got dry turkey on the table. It solves the problem completely, and you think positively about the brand. And, oh, hey, Wegmans happened to sell turkeys and turkey cooking equipment. Um, and then next up, moving along, we're into the that sort of evaluation or qualification stage, which might be a good place to do a bit of news jacking. Um, you can respond or contribute to, let's say, a consumer magazine's report on slow cookers and align yourself with, a, with an industry voice. Um, that might also be a good place to use influencer marketing. And this is, But this is really where you sort of create space so that you're able to talk about the issues customers have with a certain amount of authority. Um, at this level, you know, you can also start to feed in content that's more product focused, showcasing features without being blatantly commercial, obviously. Um, you know, I might have a, an article on must have features for slow cookers and, oh, by the way, my most popular product just happens to tick off everything in that list as well. Um, and I was looking for an example of this type of content and then I realized you're, you're actually in the middle of watching one. Uh, if we do all our, if we all do our jobs properly, then uh, you know you'll finish this confident in our ability to provide some decent advice, advice about content marketing. So you know, try not to pay too much attention to the man behind the curtain. Uh, but we'll, as we move into the sort of final stage of the the funnel, um, which is where we start to get very benefits focused to try to close the sale. So. Here you might list all the reasons that your product performs above and beyond that of your competitors. Um, but the important thing is to still be useful, still be solving problems. You can probably drop some of the marketing jargon here, get rid of the hashtags. Um, facts and figures really start to come in, and this is where you'd be looking at product descriptions and things. But keep answering questions and keep solving problems. Um, this is an example from Shell for Helix, which is a premium engine oil. And this is just a little online tool that lists all the technical details, uh, things like viscosity and evaporation levels and that sort of stuff. Um, and it explains 
exactly why you should be filling your car with one of these shell oils instead of uh, castor oil, for example. Uh, and beyond this stuff, you know, we also have post-sale content because recurring sales are typically your most valuable customers. So at this point, you also want to consider longer-term nurturing programs. But for the most part, that is kind of the basis of a workable content strategy. Uh, you've decided which customers and which search terms are worth going after. Uh, you've defined an approach. You have a tiered plan. So you can start planning for resourcing and deployment and, of course, for budgeting. Uh, and I think there's, there's actually something of a myth perpetuated around budgets. Um, while it's obviously good to have money available to prepare stuff, to create content and make it look professional, um, there does seem to be a bit of an attitude of if we aren't spending money, then it's not worth doing. Or if we aren't spending money, then it won't be any good, which which is nonsense, really. Uh, going back to the earlier example, writing an article doesn't take much investment apart from time, and it, it's possible it could be the greatest thing ever written. So don't feel you know that you have to spend on promotion. Um, but I mean, for larger organisations, this can be true because budgeting covers the cost of sort of turning on the machine. Uh, and what I mean by that is activating content developers and designers, media teams, social teams, that kind of thing. So once you get to a certain scale, it starts to make sense to have minimum activity budgets. Uh, but if you're and actually certainly working in an organization like Shell, uh, this targeting comes into this as well. Um, Shell's customer base might be motorists which is you know, a huge, broad targeting bracket. But if it was kind of mobile marketing experts who might want to attend an event who live within five miles of central London, then I could probably get cut through with a much smaller budget. Um, you know, but yeah, if you're working in a, a single market, then paying for promotion isn't always automatically needed. Now, obviously, we all hear these sort of chilling tales of uh, declining reach and the tiny attention spans of audiences. Uh, I think we're down to about three seconds at the moment. Um, but I think it's important, again, to contextualize that. Those four seconds are the time you have to attract attention, not to hold it. Uh, if you have something interesting or useful or entertaining, then people will happily sit through long-form video or, or read longer articles, regardless of the platform that they're using to access it. Um, I think that, you know, while you certainly should be creating content that is optimized to the channels it's distributed on, uh, it's also important not to underestimate your audience. Uh, I think, you know, if you take a look at something like Snapchat, you see this sort of wonderful, deep, long-form content being published there. And... That's a platform that's specifically designed to be ephemeral. Um, and also, you know, you find that some platforms are now actually limiting the amount of content brands can serve to users. Um, Snapchat possibly because of the price point, but um, something like WeChat, you can only send one message every 48 hours, I think. Um, and then if, if it's not engaged with, that content is deleted from the user's feed automatically. So it's kind of forcing brands and publishers and brands that behave like publishers to exercise a much higher level of quality control and really serve only their very best content. Um, now, you know, I'm digressing a bit here, but this actually really focuses the mind when it comes to budgeting because it forces you to prioritize and really look at which content is going to perform well. Um, you know, budgeting should be led by analytics and data. Now, you know, it might be that having an intern create a bunch of Instagram stories is a good way to go for you when you're creating content. But equally, don't fall into the trap of assuming that creation is free. Um, there's definitely a balance here. With, with media budgets, you know, you want to be constantly testing creative copy formats, platforms. Throw as much mix into, much into that testing mix as you can. Uh, and, you know, programmatic can help, 
Um, but I think, again, you know, you have to be sure that people are using it correctly I've, because I've seen several cases where three or four pieces of content are created and they're thrown into programmatic. And if one does slightly better at the start, then all of the budget is poured into that one piece and the others get no attention at all. So it's not a true test, you know. So you have to really define goals around that kind of thing and use it to sort of bring your impression prices down or to push content that's already performing well organically to, to greater heights. Um, and if you're, if you're operating in multiple markets, then I think it's valuable to think about whose budget you use for content, actually. Um, just because something is created centrally, it might be more effective to have a market pay for its promotion. Uh, generally, I think if, if people have to pay for something themselves, then they tend to treat it with a little more care and respect and pay a bit more attention to it. Um, you know, if you're just throwing quote unquote free content at them all the time, then they might not be as respectful <laughs> of that content or as interested in how it's performing. So I think um, just from the, you know, the point of view of getting stakeholders on board, uh, get them financially involved and that can have some quite useful effects as well and get them more invested in success. Um, when it comes to allocating budget, you know, there's no set figure for success. But I think if you're if you're starting out, then my first suggestion would always be to allocate a little bit of your existing PPC budget to content creation and platform management, because regardless of the results, content hangs around longer. It's going to have a longer lifespan typically than a PPC campaign. And, you know, once you get some results from that, you can begin to scale and test more effectively. So back to that first point, always be testing. Um, now, finally, I want to look, you know, looking more specifically at e-commerce and uh, less uh, imaginary slow cookers. Here's, uh, here's quite a useful quote from Gartner about content manager, uh, management in e-commerce, um, where they're saying about, you know, it's, we can't rely on content management practices and 20-year-old technology. You know, we have to stand out, basically. Uh, 2017 is, is the time to start being brave. Um, I don't know if we have any, any Seinfeld fans listening, but actually something that's always worth looking at in these cases is, believe it or not, the J.P. Eman catalog. Uh, which spent years developing a really distinct voice for its product descriptions in print. And that translates to something that's very valuable online as well. That, that thought process translates very well. In terms of the kind of on-page optimization you're doing, remember that we may well be in the evaluation and decision stage here, which we talked about earlier. Um, but, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't be developing a unique voice. You know, Google's made it fairly clear that it approves of natural language now. So now's the time to, to look at things like the, like the product description and be brave with it and be creative with it. Um, this is an example from Mr. Porter, which is a luxury men's clothing store, for those of you who don't know. Um, and I very rarely purchase Dolce & Gabbana suits, but thanks to the journal, which is their online magazine come catalog, uh, Mr. Porter is, is actually top of my mind whenever I go to it. Uh, and they have these features, things like this one, which was on how to lace new boots up, um, which is product-led, but it's not advertorial, which is a really important distinction because you know it's a long-form product description and it doesn't make a secret of the fact that it's trying to sell me some boots, but it's useful and it's interesting and it's got a distinctive tone, which is something that competitors just can't match if you can develop that tone. Uh, unless they, they hire your entire writing team, that tone belongs to you and that's what will get people coming to your pages. Um, this is thinking about sort of, you know, moving the product description beyond the product page and letting it work as a piece of distributed content in its own right. Um, as a final example, 
one company I like quite a lot is a, a little UK retailer called Norman Records, um, who replaced all the sort of product descriptions on their pages with these these very well written review sections, and these are crowdsourced, and they really help define the brand. Um, they don't become annoying or salesy, even though you know the whole page itself is has is covered in buy now buttons. Uh, in terms of copy, it's I think one of the most important things to remember is that it's okay to sell, um, but that doesn't mean you have to use salesman techniques. Uh, no disrespect to salesmen or saleswomen out there, of course. Um, but once again, this is really all about solving problems. Um, I think I'm just about out of time, so thank you very much for your time. Um, hopefully, we'll, I'll be around to answer a few more questions later as well. Great. Thanks very much, Matt. So I'm sure we'll, um, the audience have got a number of questions, and we'll come to those uh, in the Q&A. Um, but now, uh, I'd like to uh, come to uh, Mark Anderson, who's an um, SEO and content specialist at multi-channel uh, footwear retailer, uh, Shoe. Uh, so, Matt, thank you for, for joining us today. Hi. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Um, Mark, so, yes, Mark, um, tell me a little bit about your role and uh, how you approach content at Shoe. Um, well, as you said, uh, SEO and content specialist um, means my role is split sort of half and half. Um, one side of it is a more traditional um, lead, sort of leading of the SEO activity in the organization. And the other half is, is much more focused on, on content marketing and looking at it to uh, in using content to engage audiences at different points in the purchase process. Um, at SHU, we have a lot of in-house capabilities. We've got a team of copywriters, there's videographers, um, photographers, uh, designers as well as, you know, sort of um, also uh, social teams, uh, the brand team as well. However, uh, because because of the way we've, uh, we're structured uh, and also the volume of products and, and channels we have to support, not all of this, uh, not all of their time can be dedicated to to what we might refer to as, as content marketing. Uh, you know, there's a lot of sales activity that goes on there. There's sort of more uh, the lower end of the funnel stuff. Uh, and my role is to sort of put together a strategy and oversee that and ensure that there is um, effective delivery uh, of a content marketing approach, um, ensuring that we're creating create great content, engaging the users, and also um, bringing together those stakeholders. Uh, we approach that in quite a collaborative way with brainstorming sessions um, from from all the uh, sort of internal stakeholders there. Um, one thing, you know, from what we've heard earlier as well, uh, one thing we're we're trying to get better at, um, and we're certainly making strides in that area is using data to better inform the decisions and the strategic um, approaches that we're taking to the creation and distribution of content. Great, thank you. And so what would you sort of describe as the, the sort of the essential ingredients or um, uh, steps uh, to content marketing then? I think it's, it's critical that um, there's a clarity um, around the objectives. Everyone needs to understand exactly what you're trying to achieve um, with creating content, whether it's uh, smaller pieces or, or overall um, big integrated campaigns, and also how you define success, ensuring that accurate measurements could be made uh, and the relevant KPIs are put in place, and it's also at a timely, um, you know, timely intervals. It's not just two days after it's launched. It's not six weeks after it's launched. It might not even be. It might be beyond six months after a campaign has gone live that it is able to, to continue to deliver value where perhaps paid channels, uh, if the spend stops, uh, the value it's, it's delivering is, is stopping there. Um, I think as, bit, as has been alluded to already uh, today, understanding your audience is, is absolutely critical. Uh, proper research and planning um, throughout the whole process uh, in terms of not just the creation of content but the distribution uh, needs to be in place. Um, iterative learning I think is, is absolutely key as well. Um, learning from previous campaigns and as you go through um, 
the one you're you're working on or, or multiple ones you're working on at the time. Of course, any great piece of content or, or content campaign uh, sort of has that little bit of creativity and imagination, a little bit of flair, something that's going to make it make it really stand out, but all work for you as an organisation, but also deliver value to your users. Great, thank you. Uh, and what's been your uh, most successful piece uh, of content marketing to date then at Shoe? At Shoe, uh, it, I guess um, it kind of depends on how you define success or even uh, perhaps content marketing as, as we've heard earlier. Um, we've got some great product and category pages that um, have been worked on uh, extensively in terms of conversion optimization. They're great in terms of uh, the rank well in search engines are bringing a lot of traffic and a lot of revenue. Uh, our store pages are, are also really effective um, and are quite often held up as, as examples of being sort of best practice um, for for store pages there in uh, industry events. Um, but when we're looking at less transactional content, um, we've got we've actually got some great videos uh, on the site that bring in a lot of upper funnel traffic, uh, particularly from organic searches. Uh, they, these this sort of series of videos offers practical advice. Uh, around things like how to clean specific trainer models or even how to lace shoes in various different ways. Um, now, this not only helps us position our brand as an authority on all things related to footwear, uh, it provides value to present potential uh, customers and I think is, is useful uh, for building relationships with them uh, and migrating them sort of down the funnel, if you like, not, not just trying to reach them at the point at which they're trying to buy a new pair of shoes. Um, and I think answering this, these uh, questions, uh, directly being able to answer questions, is also quite important um, because the rise of voice search is going to change how uh, search engine queries are structured. Um, and I think we'll see uh, more longer tail searches and having visibility and content that allow us to, to answer those, those questions uh, is key to, to starting to build that relationship with potential customers. Great, excellent. Well, that that's been uh, really good, uh, Mark. I mean, one thing I sort of you know like to touch on there is uh, you know, and I think this ties in with uh, some of the results of the poll that I, I'm just going to sh uh, show now. Um, but it's how you mentioned you know the importance of uh, defining uh, success because I think when it comes to you know defining success, you you need to measure it, and I I can see from the results of the poll here, thanks for everyone that answered, is that our, you know, the most, the biggest challenge uh, that people on the webinar have said today is about measuring content effectiveness. Um, so I guess it would be good to open it up uh, at this point of discussion, and perhaps Chris, you be the, uh, it'd be great for you to start. So, you know, what can uh, brands do to improve the way they measure content effectiveness? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, you know, really what I think it just comes down to is just really I think everyone needs to just watch all the related content KPIs, you know, so from web analytics to social engagement data, conversion rates. You know, I touched on a little earlier, I think A-B testing is super important when it comes down to this. And then that's really the kind of the key points there, I think, Andrew, for, uh, for everyone to take away is just, you know, KPIs, analytics, social engagement, and conversion rates, and split testing. Great, thanks. And uh, Mark, you know, how do you, you mentioned sort of the difference of sort of time scales in measuring success and, you know, how they can be different. I, I mean, is there a single process you use at Shoe to, to measure content effectiveness, or, or can it uh, vary depending on what you're trying to achieve? No, it absolutely has to vary depending on what you're trying to achieve, I think. Um, if a piece of content is there directly to convert people, then um, you know from from leads to sales, uh, then the needs that needs to be understood from the very start, and measure, um, you need to make sure you're accurately measuring that. Another piece of content might look the the purpose of it might be actually around servicing uh, customers or or inspiring them perhaps. In which case you'd need to look at look at other metrics. Uh, if it's inspiring people, perhaps. Uh, Engagement with the content, social shares, social reach is is more of a valid metric there um, when looking at effectiveness rather than direct sort of almost like last click conversions. Great, thanks. And touching on that that second, I, I think it's the second highest or joint second actually 
um, challenge, which is about developing content marketing skills. Uh, Mark, you know, when you're at Shoe, you've obviously got different types of content, some such as product descriptions, uh, merchandising, others that, you know, appear in all different forms of social media. Um, and you've got a, a large team to help uh, do that. Do you think that there's um, a, a challenge in requiring different skills for different types of content? Yeah, very much so. Um, I think it's it, it's part of a, a wider thing that, that relates to the whole um, content marketing industry as well. Uh, I think uh, we're learning as we're going uh, as an entire industry. Uh, different countries and cities are perhaps more developed in terms of the, the skill sets in, in, in the workforce that is there. Um, but I think really for me, it's important that people have specialisms and are really allowed to focus on those on those key specialisms and be absolute experts in what they do in that area. But it needs something that's going to sort of all, the overarching strategy and plan that's going to bring that together and get the most out of those and know when to use those specific skill sets at the right time. If they're not in place, you know there are options to uh, either develop those within the workforce or look externally to, to sort of uh, plug the gaps there as well. Great, thanks. And uh, one question for uh, Chris on the the other challenge before we um, uh, head to answer the Q&A that's uh, coming in uh, in quite some numbers now. Um, and we'll continue a, a little bit longer to try and answer as many questions as you can. Is um, Chris, one of these challenges about creating enough content, and um, in your presentation you mentioned um, using freelancers, which is an approach you know I've used, I know Matt's also used. Um, I mean, what do you have to look for to uh, find uh, a great freelance content specialist, and are there any uh, challenges involved with that? Yeah, that's a great question, Andrew. Um, you know, I'm just kind of coming off my experience, you know, from where what we do here at Constant Content. And I think the real challenge is just kind of either finding a partner that can help source those freelance writers, like someone like Constant Content, um, really finding out what the need is, what's the end goal, and getting, you know, finding that partner to help you bring forward candidates, um, and then through even split testing and doing different channels to find out what's working for your team as, uh, you know, projects may want to scale. Uh, so it really just comes down to spending the right time uh, researching and not just jumping the gun at the first uh, option that comes forward. So Great, thanks. Uh, so yes, and now I think is a good time to uh, answer some of those questions um, that are coming in. Um, so now, uh, looking at the first one I, I'm going to pick here, uh, comes from Holly, um, who works for a franchise company. Um, and she says that her challenge is about creating the right content uh, that's informative to the user uh, and strategic on delivering uh, their goals. Um, shall we kick off with you, uh, Matt? I mean, what you mentioned sort of, uh, you know, the bias journey and so on and so forth, but um, how, how do you sort of decide to create the right content? Um, yeah, that's it's a complicated question, isn't it? Um, I mean, something I've I've sort of come across quite recently. It ties in ties into this is that I'm working across a vast array of different markets, which are all at slightly different levels of experience. They all have unique KPIs, different goals, different products. Um, so you know, it's it's hard to come up with that that one size fits all strategy. Um, I think really the only thing you can do is trust your analytics. Um, I remember recently sort of looking at some some demographics for the well the same demographic segment in the U.S. and Canada for uh, I think it was for automobiles, you know, and you might assume that to be reasonably similar, um, but actually you'd find vast preference differences within those targeting groups. So creating creating content that fits it's not a i don't think you can ever assume what will or won't work you know you really do have to just dig into your data as much as you can around that kind of thing great thanks um one question i have here from uh, angelica she works for a, a sort of multinational uh, company for um fmcg or consumer packaged goods 
she's got a question here about, you know, how do you create uh, great product descriptions uh, for food? Um, so uh, first Chris and then perhaps Mark, uh, have you got any ideas to help Angelica? Yeah, and that's, that's a great question. Thanks, Angelica. So creating product copy around food, like I kind of mentioned earlier in this slide, you know, I think where the product descriptions need to really hit home is, like I said, igniting that kind of imagination. So if you're keeping it too generic, I think people aren't going to be inspired to either purchase that, that food or what's going to help create that dish. Um, so I think painting that picture and allowing them to use that imagination that's in the product description um, to get them thinking that they need that product to, to purchase it, I think would be a, a, probably a pretty good way to start. And finding out really who the target audience is and, you know, if it's, a, if it's your everyday mom or, you know, the dad or whoever the case may be, hitting them home and allowing them to create that imagination to go forward and, and convert that sale. Great, thanks. Uh, Mark, what are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I agree with that. Um, I think, yeah, it's absolutely key to understand who is uh, actually uh, viewing that or likely to be viewing that product description. Um, you know, who, who's making the purchase decision and promoting that in an imaginative and, and lively way. Um, I was actually reading something earlier this week. Uh, I think it's from Lab, and it was uh, a white paper on what they called the halo effect. Uh, and this research was conducted using uh, video content, really, but it applies neuroscience to create better content. And the idea is that emotive language and empathy, so that's the emotion uh, that's expressed in a piece of content, will be mirrored by customers. Um, and so taking those things on board and you know, not being uh, scared of describing something uh, as being, you know, uh, absolutely beautiful, delicious, uh, but you, you know, with that audience understanding, using the same or similar words that um, that your target audience would use, and knowing what emotions or responses you're trying to trigger and evoke um, in them, I think that that can really help um, with making uh, you know that product description stand out and be effective. Great, thank you. Um, so we have one question um, here, um, which again I think it sort of lends itself well to um, e-commerce, and this comes in from uh, Dan, um, and he says, you know, if you, if you got, and uh, maybe Mark, you want to answer this um, uh, first before Chris again, um, you know, if you've got thousands of uh, SKUs, so thousands of products uh, on your site, you know, how do you deal with uh, product descriptions? Because I take it that you know that's something you deal with uh, frequently, Mark. Yeah, it is, and it's something that um, takes a lot of time uh, and a lot of resource for us um, because we know that um, you know creating unique, uh, valuable product descriptions is is really key, and it's where a lot of our uh, copywriting content creation resource actually actually has to sit because we know it does provide value for us. Um, so you know there is a lot of resource that goes into that, a lot of time. Um, and a lot of effort. It is quite, I appreciate that there is a, a huge challenge in that, um, but depending on, on how that, um, you know, it, it can be beneficial across uh, multiple channels. You know, if you've got a Google shopping feed that takes the product description from the page, for example, you know, it's not just the, the copy that sits on there, it's the copy that sits in, in Google shopping. Uh, it's valuable to your SEO efforts. Uh, it could be valuable to your branding as well. Um, so, you know, really, I, I would say it is something that is worth investing heavily in. Great. And uh, Chris, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and, that, and it's, you know, I've had a few people ask me this as well. And, you know, where do, where do I start is kind of that answer. And I think just starting is the answer, you know, and it's going to come down to, I think, priorities of maybe higher ticket items that you're looking to um, Maybe you found that your cart's getting abandoned in, and there could be a, a case that that product description isn't um, helping convert. So, you know, like um, Mark was saying with analytic tools, you know, I would start there, but also it's just it's just starting. It's getting them populated. I mean, it can be very overwhelming dealing with a uh, a huge catalog of SKUs, but it, it just comes down to 
if you have to slowly chip away at them, it's, it's going to benefit you rather than just waiting to uh, do them all at once. So I would say short answer, starting at them, finding out where the priorities are, and you know, getting them uh, up and targeted to, uh, to your customers. Great, excellent. And I think we've probably only got um, time for, for one more. So, um, uh, Chris, I'll, I'll ask you this, which um, uh, comes from Lily. Um, so what are your suggestions for companies that, you know, might have a lot of high-quality content, uh, but the challenge is getting uh, traffic to the content? Uh, you know, what do they need to review or what uh, tactics should they be considering? Yeah, that's a great question. And honestly, I think this is, might be more of a Mark or Matt answer. Um, sure. Coming more from an analytical point, and maybe I'll pass it over to those gentlemen because I think they could probably give her a bit more value than I, I think I can provide at this current moment. So, so maybe Matt, because you've dealt with, um, you know, blogs and sites with uh, thousands of uh, pages, um, you know, how can you get uh, traffic to, you know, lots of this content? Um, I think, yeah, that's an interesting question. I think from coming at it from a sort of e-commerce uh, angle. I think what you have to do really is, I mean, this probably goes back to the previous question slightly as well. You know, when you're thinking about, I have lots of products, I have lots of descriptions, I need traffic to thousands of pages, um, is to to kind of utilize the the high ranking and the high converting pages on your site first of all. Kind of come at, come at this process from both ends really. Um, you know, and to start by prioritizing your high ranking pages and then getting rid of your low ranking pages or pruning them out and then you know sort of and then going at the process of sort of rewriting thinner content duplicate content that kind of thing um i do think it probably goes back as well to what i was saying about making sure contents aligned um i think you know from from a sort of, from when you're blogging from an seo perspective just doing simple housekeeping like making sure that you have that you've picked some high priority pages and that every article you write contains a couple of deep links internally into those pages you know directing and think about it from the user perspective think where you know can i add a link here that will lead them to this page and just letting google know what is most important on your site uh, what would you like or what's most helpful on your site? What would you like people to see the most? And sort of thinking about, again, what what is your most useful content? What solves the, the problem that the majority of your users have? Great. Perfect. Well, I, I mean, we've got a, a lot of questions, which, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, Chris, uh, you know, it'd be great if we could sort of, you know, get back to people who've asked these questions, but we haven't had time to cover them today. Uh, but yes, we will get back to those and we will uh, be uh, covering uh, some of the content uh, on the ClickSe blog. And of course, you'll also receive a recording uh, of this webinar. Uh, but that, that wraps it up. So, you know, do make sure that you, uh, you know, do check out the, your email for the link to the recording for this webinar um, and also sign up for our uh, further webinars and a whole range of topics. Um, so, you know, I, I'd like to uh, thank Chris and, and the Constant Content team for sponsoring this session today and providing some excellent discussion. Uh, I'd encourage you to uh, email Chris with any questions you might have. Uh, his email, uh, in case you need it, is cread, spelled C-R-E-I-D, at constant-content.com. I'd also like to thank uh, Matt from Shell and Mark for Shoe, from Shoe for joining us uh, and providing their expert input too. And also, you know, of course, I'd like to very much thank you, the audience, for attending and providing uh, such good discussion today. So on that note, and on behalf of the ClickZ team, uh, thank you uh, very much for uh, attending and have a wonderful day. Uh, goodbye.